your lab goes. At that point, we might adjourn and go into uh, lab. The question was how to make a table. All right. Uh, one of the things you have to do for your last lab is you have to parse the um, parse the XML and make a table. All right. The question is is how to do it. Well, there's two ways you could do it. All right. The easy way and the hard way. All right. Um, I sound like in the old 40s gangster movie. We can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. It really doesn't matter which way you take, all right, in my mind. Uh, I'm going to start and I'm going to demonstrate the easy way, then I'll talk a little bit about the hard way. Um, the easy way is this. Let's go and let's, let's look actually look at the code that we have for the quiz, uh, not the quiz, what am I thinking? Oh, the word translation. Let's say that in addition to in addition to the drop down list, we also want to put a table out of those words. All right, so we'll do both. We're currently putting a drop down list. We'll also put a table out of the words. So let me go and open the relevant page. So, when I go here, All right. When we go here, in addition to forming the drop down, let's make somewhere over here a table. Doesn't really matter where. I'm going to do this, but to make it challenging for you, I'm not going to show it to you. All right. That'll be that'll be then your your job to to figure out what you need to do. So we'll just pop somewhere on the page a table. Doesn't really matter where. All right. In addition to the drop down. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I'm terming the easy way. All right. Now, the easy way involves this sort of thinking, right? We've seen from our previous examples, including the coin example, all right, and I'm trying to think of the other ones, the coin example, and you know, um, a lot of the other ones that we can, through our JavaScript, create any kind of uh, HTML we want to on our page. Right. With the coin example, what did we do? We created a string that contained the image. Then we looped through and we concatenated that string together. And then when we were all done, we popped it into uh, an inner HTML somewhere. We could do an identical thing with the table. All right. So I could do something like this if I was going to make a table. I'll go here and I'll say, you know, t equals table. All right. So I'm going to set a variable equal to t for table. I'm going to put a results. I'm going to put a second results div down here and I'll call it results table. That's where I'm going to put the table. All right. So I set my variable to t. Each time through the loop, I'm going to go and I'm going to create a table row that contains a two table cells and contains the data. This again is where understanding what you need to produce is key. You have to understand the HTML that you want to produce. What do we want to produce? We want to produce one table tag at the beginning, an end table tag at the end, and then we want to create a bunch of TRs that have a TD, have the word, an NTD, the index, whatever that happens to be, and then an NTR. So each time through the loop we want to create that. We want to create a TR that contains a TD, 
that we literally want to create, we want to concatenate the value of the index, let's say. We want to add to that our NTD, our second TD. We want to concatenate on the end of that the word. Then we want to concatenate onto that the NTD tag, whoops, NTD tag and the NTR tag. This we want to add to the end of the variable that we're accumulating the table in. All right? So, in practice, it's going to look like this. T equals what was in there before plus TR, TD, plus, whoops, enclose the quotes. All I'm doing is I'm forming a string, and that string happens to contain some H, uh, HTML. I'll grab the index first child node, because that is the value of the index, plus and TD, TD, plus the word, whoops, plus and TD, and TR. So what this line does is it starts off with T as being just a table tag. Each iteration through the loop, we're adding to that table tag a TR tag that contains two TDs and contains the value of the index and the value of the word. When we're all done, we want to add to that T variable our end table tag. Just a string that contains exactly what tag we want to put. And then finally, we want to say document dot get element by ID results table. Dot inner HTML equals T. So what are we doing? In in retrospect, we're creating a variable that's going to contain our table tag. All right. We start out with T. Each trip through the loop, we add a TR and TD to it. When we're all done, we add our end table tag to that string. So if I do an alert right here. I should see a well-formed table tag with that many rows. And then we take that table and put it into the inner HTML here. Let's try it, make sure that I dotted my T's and crossed my I's. All right, and sure enough, there it is, a B. and so on down the line. All right? Well, what I did is as I was making the drop down, it's sort of independent of it. As I was making the drop down, I made the table. And um, I made the table um, by taking and concatenating on each uh, trip through the loop um, a string that contains the tags that I wanted to do. All right? Questions about that? In that respect, and, and again, one, one of the things I said, I was talking to my other class about this, and I said, you know, obviously we can't cover every single scenario in class that you, that you are likely to encounter, but one, a, a, a good skill is to be able to look and, and, and say, you know what, I didn't do this exactly before, but I did something similar to this, all right? 
And in this case, what similar to this is the image in the loop. So, you know, you loop through, you create an image, you pop the, that variable in the inner HTML. And, you know, you could do the same thing. You know, you're doing a very similar thing here except it's with table tags. Question. Oh, that was your question. Wow. Yes. Is there a way of when you're using the index for a child, I think in the book it said appendix child, if you wanted to um, point to not the first child, but the second child and the third child? Yeah. Um, yeah, actually. Yeah, actually, there, there's a lot of. Um, functions and expressions that you can run uh, on, on uh, DOM nodes. Let's, let's Google that and see. Here's a list of like all the things that you can do. Um, I wish they would display them differently, but this will do. Get the next sibling of a node. All right. What that does is um, if we're looking at a node, we can ask for the next sibling. A sibling node is a node that's on the same level as, as, as it. In other words, they have the same parent. So you said to get a list of all the nodes that, that were underneath it. One way to do it is you could get the first node, ask for the first child node, then ask for that node's next sibling, then ask for that node's next sibling, and ask, ask for that uh, node's next sibling until you run out of nodes. All right? And it'll probably return false or null. I, let me think. It would, it would return a null when you hit the end of the line. So if you made it all the way through through all the siblings, then it would return a, a null. Is it a good idea to use last child for your last sibling or last child? It, it, just depends, it just depends on what you want to do. It just depends on what you want to do. All right? Uh, depends on the data and specifically how you need to parse it. You have all these options available for you, and again, situationally, each one of them will be um, the right thing to do. You know, there's a lot of different approaches that you could take to that. All right. So that's one way to make a table. Would be like this, and that's a perfectly fine way to make it. You can make it like this, no problem. All right. What's the other way? Well, the other way must be the hard way. All right. And I posted an ex uh, a, a reference page on Angel that I will not go over in much detail, but I'll point you to it if you want an extra challenge. I know for me, Thanksgiving means a lot of things. One of the things it means is JavaScript programming, right? So after you've eaten your dinner and you want to kick back and relax and do something, after you get it done the easy way, you know, by all means, try it the little more challenging way. And what is a little bit more challenging way? Instead of formulating a big giant string and plopping it into the inner HTML, which works, all right, you can actually create the objects individually. That's sort of like what we're doing with the drop down, right? With the drop down, I'm creating an options object and I'm adding that options object to the end of the drop down. You could do the same thing with the table example. And what I've posted is I've posted table DOM stuff that if we look at it, it contains all the functions that are available for a table. All right? So you can call, you know, insert row functions. All right? You can call cells functions to access the cells within that row. So you could make a cell within the row and, and all that. Um, 
If you really want to get ambitious, you would look and do it that way. That would be an alternate way of, of doing it as opposed to creating a giant string and putting it in. My suggestion is, uh, unless you're real comfortable with doing the giant string and putting it in, you know, get that working first, and then if you want to play with this, go ahead and give that a shot. And I can give you a hand if you have any questions, but I did want to point out in general terms uh, the approach. In essence, we could have done, where am I? You know, that's the approach we took with the drop down. We sort of took the purest approach of actually hitting the individual, actually creating the objects as opposed to creating a big string and putting that. I could have done a similar thing for the drop down that I did with the table. Compose a giant string that contains select, name equals, whatever, and, and all the individual options each time through the loop. I could have done it that way, but I chose to take the object approach in, in that case. Um, for the table, um, I'm doing it uh, the, the simpler way. Questions about this? Yeah, go ahead. No, no. Uh, if you look, for example, what, what, I, what I think you're thinking of is where I'm making the XML. Yeah. Results equals word list. That's just the name of my root tag. Remember, every XML file, every piece of XML data has a root node. And all the nodes live inside of that root. All right? So, for example, in an XHTML document, an, an XML HTML document or XHTML document, the root node is the HTML tag, right? Because every tag lives inside of that tag. In my particular case, my root tag is word list. So if I go and, in other words, if I go and run this code, Notice the XML that it produced, the root tag, or the root node, is word list. And then the word list contains items. Each item contains a word and contains an index. So yeah, that, that's just the name that I made up. Well, that's the array that I have the English and Spanish words, yes. The word list is part of the XML data that I sent back to the client. So yeah, they, they each have their role to play in this example. Other questions? All right, let's look at JSON. I'm glad there's no one in here named Jason, otherwise everyone would be turning and looking at him. Here's a couple links that I would uh, ask you to peruse at your leisure. Speeding up Ajax with JSON is one of them. And the other one is a more detailed description of, of JSON. I hate the fact that Angel creates this and, and keeps its URL on top because that's actually, you know, the, you're not actually getting the URL. But at any rate, you can also Google it. Here's some charts that take a minute to read through it and you'll understand everything you need to know about it. I'm just joking. No, that's the kind of that, that that's the kind of stuff I like to print out and throw away and never look at it again. All right. Um let, let me let me see if I can put this right. This kind of stuff is important for the people that design the code to process this data, not the people that use JSON. All right. 
like for example, if you look at the W3 specs on HTML. Whoa, that, that's, those are confusing. I mean, I know HTML and I don't understand the W3 specs. Well, that's not made for web designers. That's made for browser makers, the specs. And that's sort of the same thing here. All right. But anyhow, if you are interested, you can look at it. And there was a specific example I wanted to look at that was somewhere here. I don't know. It's escaping me at this point. I guess we'll have to just look at our own examples. Oh, yeah, here we go. They show the same data with XML and with JSON. And you can take a look at that. Again, let's summarize the important stuff and the stuff that, that I would like you to get out of this uh, section on JSON. JSON, again, sort of hits the middle ground between XML data and delimited data. JSON is more complex than delimited data, but not as complex as XML. JSON is more flexible than delimited data but not quite as flexible as XML. JSON takes up more space than delimited data, but it doesn't take as much as XML. Again, it sort of fills that middle slot. The big advantage that JSON has over delimited data is that you can, you can define structures in JSON just like you can in XML. So if you have sort of a hierarchical data, like an organizational chart or something like that, that's very hard to represent in delimited data. You can do it, but it's tricky. With JSON or XML, you can build the structure, you can build the hierarchy right into the data itself. All right, so in that regard, it's advantageous. But it comes with less overhead. All right, let's look at our Dictionary example using JSON. And functionally it, it looks the same. So we won't, we won't be able to visibly see a difference. Only when we dissect it and actually look at the code inside. All right, so we type in A, all right, just as it did before. All right, so again, what pieces of the AJAX process are going to be different for JSON, do you suppose, than they were for delimited data and for XML? Creating the objects, any different? No. Forming the request, any different? No. Processing the request on the server and returning to the client, yes, that will be different. We're going to format the data differently following the rules of JSON. All right. Finally, parsing the response on the client side and displaying the results Yes, that's going to be different because we're not getting back the limited data, we're not getting back XML data, we're getting back JSON data. So, let's take a look at this. 
And we'll start out by looking at the server code. In essence, it's the same. But notice that the overhead that we have looks a little different. In other words, in the XML example, we were putting in XML tags there. All right. In the JSON example, we're putting in the code that's needed for JSON. Let's go and run the server-side code and let's see what we want our JSON output to look like. Remember, JSON, J-S-O-N, stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Now, I realize this can get confusing, all right? But it's the kind of notation that is used in JavaScript. It doesn't mean that it only can be used with JavaScript. Okay. Obviously, we're, we're creating this via PHP. So, via PHP, we can create this as well. How is this like JavaScript? It's like JavaScript in this way. Brackets are used for grouping. All right. So we have a bracket at the beginning, and we have a bracket at the end that represents the end of our data. So the data that we're sending is everything from the first bracket to the last bracket. What does that consist of? consists of something called a word list, which really, in this example, corresponds to the, the root node, right, of the XML data. Because if you remember, our, our root node was also called word list. Where have we seen these square brackets in JavaScript before? Where have we seen square brackets? Or, okay, we, we see it around i in a for next loop. Why do we use the square brackets then in that case? What are we referencing? Yeah, we're referencing an array. We're referencing the subscript of an array. So, given that this is JavaScript object notation, the square brackets have effectively the same meaning. This square bracket means that the word list is actually an array. All right? That's what the square bracket means. The word list is an array. Here's where the array starts. Here's where the array ends. Okay? Now, what is the array composed of? An array is composed of elements, right? Each of the elements of this word list array is then enclosed in the braces. So this, I'm having a hard time highlighting precisely what I want to do, but this word absolute value index zero, that's in braces. That is my first array element. My first array element in word list starts here and ends here. And this array element is, has two parts. It has a word and it has an index. Notice how this is very much analogous to, to XML. Logically, this is the same data, right? In both cases, we have a word list. Those, that word list is composed of individual items. Each of those items contains a word and it contains an index. So, word list is an array. Each element has a word part and an index part. Now this is similar, the notation is, is real similar to what we have used in CSS as well. Because right? if you notice, each one of these, we have an attribute name, 
a colon, and then an attribute value. So in other words, word has a value of absolute value. Index has a value of zero. So as you can see, we can kind of write array-like statements. You know, word list sub zero dot word is going to be absolute uh, value, right? Because the first element of this word list array is this guy. The word portion of it has a value of absolute value. Likewise, the index portion has a value of zero. So, that's kind of what this output means. To, to, to reiterate, we have braces to group stuff together. So we're sending back this data, we have braces around it. Braces like create a group of data, a chunk of data. So we have one set of braces around the entire thing that says, hey, this is our data. We then can use, this is our word list, colon, what is our word list? Here's the value of it. Given that we have the square brackets, that indicates that it's an array. And an array is composed of elements. And therefore we group these elements together by putting them in braces. So that's the output, and if you read through this, it's very similar to what we've done with the XML. The only difference is different overhead, right? In XML, our overhead consists of start tags and end tags and that kind of stuff. In the case of this JSON data, our overhead consists of brackets and braces and curly brackets and words and semicolons and, colons and commas and that sort of stuff. So. Equivalent, the same data. I, I haven't actually counted it up, but my guess would be that this would be less, uh, less characters involved than the XML one. All right. Again, le less characters involved. Because with this, you don't really have a start and end tag. The braces sort of do that for you. So it's probably less overhead with this. And again, depending on the data, that could be probably even more dramatic than this. All right. So that's how we create it. How do we parse it? Oh, you're going to like this. Parsing it is pretty easy. First of all, I do an eval. I put a parenthesis before and after the response text, and I do an eval. That's probably the one most confusing line of, of this example. What that says is, make that string into an object. That converts that string into an object. Notice with the JSON, we're back to returning a string. Right? We're not returning XML data. I didn't have that header HTML, or I'm sorry, a header XML bit in the, um, uh, in the PHP code. So my response comes as part of the response text. So I put a parenthesis before and after it. I run it through the eval. The effect is that if this is proper JSON code, this now becomes an object. All right? And we can access the elements in that object um, the way we would access any elements using that dot notation. So, as I'm looping through, response, that's that string, that's this, turned into a JavaScript object. Dot word list, what's word list? Well, that's the array that contains all the words. Dot length, that's how I ask for the length of any array in PHP, right? The array name dot length. Well, in this case, that array word list lives in the response object, because this converts that string into a response object. So I say, give me the list of the, or I'm sorry, give me the length of the word list array in the response object. Then as I loop through, I say, in that 
response object for word list array element sub i, give me the word part of that. Give me the index part of it. So as we're looping through that array, the zeroth element, we grab the word part of it, we grab the index part of it. The next time through the loop, we grab the next word index, and so on over and over as we travel through the loop. All right? Yes? The length of it is a number of elements in the array. So in this case, I would guess the length would be like 26 or 27, actually. So there's 27 elements, but the, but the length is a number of elements in the array. So we do that for as many elements are in the array. Question about that? It's just a different way to do it. It has its own set of advantages and disadvantages, not as involved as XML, less overhead than XML, um, and more flexible and, and, and able to show some kind of structure uh, unlike delimited data. Um, the tricks in this is number one, you have to format it right. Believe me, I think my eyes went crossed formatting it right like this because it's tricky. All right, You have to know and you have to be able to follow these conventions of how that works. The, that's a trick on the server side to get that formatting right. The trick on the client side is to do this little eval, which again takes that response text, which is that big old string of data, and makes it into an object. Now that it's an object, we can use that object dot notation to access the different pieces of it. All right. questions on this. All right, let's get to lab. A um, little bit of a short class today. Let's get to lab and I'll try to address um, any questions that you might have.